Good morning and good afternoon in Washington, Brussels, and Moscow. I'm Robert Legvold, director of the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative, and we're here for two reasons. First, to introduce the vision animating the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative, which is reflected in the statement that is being issued today. It is a vision of a Euro-Atlantic security community stretching from North America across Europe through Russia that is undivided and without gray zones. Our second purpose is to comment on two potentially portentous events occurring this month and next. The first of those is the NATO summit, which will occur in Lisbon in order to adopt the new strategic concept for NATO. Uh, President Medvedev will be attending that meeting. The second is the OSCE Heads of State Summit in Astana, the first in 11 years. For that purpose, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce the three co-chairs of the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative in Moscow, former Minister Igor Ivanov, assisted by Samuel Green, the Deputy Director of the Carnegie Moscow Center in uh, in uh, Delaware, Senator Sam Nunn in New York, Ambassador Wolfgang Isinger, and in Brussels, a member of the commission, the former Deputy Foreign Minister, Ambassador Alexandra Chale, who's traveled from Kiev to be with us. Uh, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, uh, Sam Green in Moscow, Ambassador Jim Collins with me here, and in Brussels, uh, Matthew Royansky, who is the Deputy Director of the Russia-Eurasia Program that Jim heads at Carnegie. Mentioning them uh, allows me to note that the Carnegie Endowment is absolutely critical as the initiator of this project and providing the critical underpinning for it. The co-chairs have some initial comments, and I turn first to Senator Sam Nunn. Sam? Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, if you have any difficulty hearing me, let me know by some kind of signal. I am seeing everyone, and we've had some audio problems here, so I'll uh, proceed as if you are hearing me. Eleven months ago when we launched this initiative, we said there could be no coherent, effective global security strategy that does not take Russia into account. The Cold War is over. Although we recognize that the threats we face now in the 21st century are different from those we faced during the second half of the 20th century, uh, our attitudes, our strategic doctrines, and our force postures remain largely poised to respond to the threats of the past. The threats we face now are threats that the United States, Europe, and Russia face equally, from catastrophic terrorism and nuclear proliferation to cyber attacks, energy security, the spread of drug trafficking, and the threat of infectious disease and biological terrorism. The only way we can meet these threats is through a, through a true strategic partnership where the United States, Europe, and Russia work together as a single Euro-Atlantic security community. Fundamental to moving in a new direction is the transformation of the NATO-Russian relationship. This will not happen overnight, but there are important steps that we can take now. By pursuing arrangements that increase warning and decision time for NATO and Russia, as well as for all nations in the region, we would reduce the risk of accidental nuclear launch, provide a foundation of confidence and transparency, and introduce substantial stability in the relationship. By making adjustments in operational doctrine as applied to strategic, tactical, as well as conventional forces, we could take a giant step toward ending the militarized framework of NATO-Russia relations. This would also provide an umbrella of mutual trust needed to tackle the broader security issues confronting the U.S., Russia, and Europe with considerable momentum for a true partnership. Missile defense is also a potential game changer in U.S., Russian, and NATO Russian relations. And Wolfgang and Igor and I have written uh, our bad piece on that. I won't go into details except to say that. This is enormously important and could change uh, all the surrounding environment if we can find ways of working together on missile defense. Of course, freeing relations between Russia and some of its neighbors from the baggage of the past will be integral to spurring broader Euro-Atlantic collective security. As the states of Western Europe have overcome difficult historical legacies 
so must Russia and its immediate neighbors. And by the same process of fully respecting sovereignty and working toward effective conflict resolution, military transparency, and mutual reconciliation policies. And I might add that the uh, reapproachment between Russia and Poland is an auspicious first step and should be expanded to the Baltic states. So that is encouraging. And wrapping up, I would say this is a critical time for all of us as NATO and the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe prepare for key meetings that will address the challenges facing the Euro-Atlantic community and will guide their organization for years to come. It is crucial that their leaders rise above past differences and set a course that boldly addresses the practical steps that are essential for the creation of a genuine Euro-Atlantic security community and for the improved uh, well-being and security and economic terms of all of our citizens. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Sam. I turn now to uh, Moscow to Minister Ivanov. Igor. Good morning, good afternoon. To be, to be frank, uh, I had settled doubts about the EC initiative when we were launching it a year ago. We uh, saw a lot of initiatives without uh, big success. Today, I'm sure that EC was a good idea. And it, was all the, it, it has all the views for success. There are Russian, American, and the European representatives in our commission. All of us, uh, with plenty of experience in government and private sector, we are very much aware of the national interests, interests of our countries in the security field. And we think that our national interests can be better guaranteed if we form a security community in our Euro-Atlantic region. We know well enough how hard it is to break old mindsets and bureaucratic forces. But the presidents of Russia and the United States demonstrated by signing the new START treaty that it is quite possible. This is the way how the Cold War containment should yield to common security policies. What we say in our statement, you could see in, in uh, many other documents, uh, including the one signed uh, on the highest level, but there was a trouble with uh, these ideas. They never were put into practice. Today we have a good chance of doing just that. Important summits are ahead of us, like the NATO one in Lisbon and the OSI in Astana. Our commission proposes to them concrete steps toward, uh, towards the security community in the Euro-Atlantic uh, space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Igor. And now I turn to um, Ambassador Isinger. Wolfgang? Good morning, good afternoon. Representing the voice of European countries between, geographically, between the United States and Russia, I would like to start out by pointing to the fact that we are living at a time of a paradigm shift, where in the past the nation of Europe lived under a constant threat uh, and perception of danger of being invaded by their own neighbors. That was the fear of the strong. Today, increasingly, all of our countries are beginning to realize that we share a new fear together, the fear of the weak, of the failing states, of countries that cannot protect their own borders and their own citizens. Uh, the recognition of shared and common interests is what leads us in this commission to believe that we are facing a historic window of opportunity for bringing the states, the countries, uh, which Bob, Professor Legwald mentioned at the beginning, from the United States across Western Europe, and including, of course, Russia and other countries, 
without creating new gray areas in between or bringing all of them together into a uh, security community. Uh, let me add two um, more specific points uh, to the ones already made by, by Senator Nunn and Minister Ivanov. Uh, we have seen, um, and that is good news, uh, bilateral progress between the United States and Russia in the area of arms control through the New START Treaty. I believe that it is important that the members of NATO, as they meet for their summit, um, try to find a way to make their own contribution to the beginning new dynamic of arms control and disarmament, not only in order to improve our security in and around Europe, but also in order to make credible contributions to um, the international non-proliferation regime. And finally, let me say that um, the one commodity which we have, which, which, which has lacked probably more than anything else in our international relationships across uh, the countries that are represented here in the uh, Easy Commission is trust. And that is why we as a commission believe that uh, concrete uh, examples must be uh, presented, concrete action must be taken uh, in the areas that Senator Nunn mentioned, in the areas of addressing and trying to tackle the so-called frozen conflicts uh, and in many other areas which are mentioned uh, in our vision paper. So, in conclusion, let me say that as we approach these two summits, leaders should understand that they need to be bold. Uh, this is an opportunity which may not soon come again um, in this dimension. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wolfgang. And, and then, finally, I'd like to give uh, Ambassador Chalet in Brussels, a member of the Commission, uh, a word if he chooses. Alexandra? Thank you, Wolfgang. I am Ambassador Chale from Ukraine, and for my country, this initiative has a very strategic value for two things. First, this initiative starts the process of peaceful reconciliation in NATO and Russia, and practically helps us to overcome the negative legacy of the Cold War. Second, and we are speaking about it in this case, Without clear security steps and clear security guarantees to Ukraine, it's impossible to construct a new democratic security community. It's very important. And finally, I want to tell that the democratic security initiative is a common answer, a single answer to the common dangers which democratic world needs in the 21st century. And we have no chance to promote this initiative and to create a strong geopolitical security or to have a very quick challenges. Thank you very much, Alexander. Now we would like to have a conversation in Washington, Brussels, and Moscow with those attending. And we're going to start in Washington, Jim. Well, thank you very much, Bob. Um, I think what I'd like to do is simply ask uh, my attendees here whether one or another would like to uh, put a question or give us a comment. Could I have a volunteer here? Lowell Schwartz from uh, Rand Corporation. Uh, thank you. I'll just make a, um, a brief comment. Thank you very much for um, inviting me to this session. Um, you know, I, I think that there are um, you know, three main areas that um, we need to work on sort of overcoming the differences. Um, the first one, which I think is the most fraught, is the, the protracted conflicts that remain. Um, the second one is missile defense, which will be a major topic, which I think there actually has been a great deal of progress made uh, moving missile defense from a more unilateral U.S. concern now to a broader concern. And, um, and finally, um, conventional arms control, um, CFE, which um, when we talk about not having any gray zones, 
um, arms control, the transparency that comes from arms control, the limitations that comes from arms control are a key point of that. And it would be very useful to work on how everyone can become back involved in the negotiations and to update and modernize the current arms control regime. So I think those are three areas that this initiative in general would be, would be very helpful. Lowell, thank you very much. Sam, I'm going to have you say a word uh, sharing some of your thoughts in the conventional area. But first, I think uh, it's worth announcing that under the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative, we will be forming a working group to attempt to develop ideas for addressing the political and bureaucratic obstacles to genuine trilateral missile defense cooperation. That working group is going to be co-chaired by uh, Stephen Hadley, the former National Security Advisor on the U.S. side, and General Vyacheslav Trubnikov uh, among the Russians, and they will be working in order to produce practical uh, suggestions in this area. We do agree, as uh, Senator Nunn emphasized and as the three co-chairs have written in the International Herald essay, the importance of this as literally a game changer in the Euro-Atlantic security context. Sam, do you have some further comments you'd make on the conventional arms control issue? Well, I think the agreements that we entered into back during the uh, end of the Cold War uh, really need to be updated, as our friend from Rand just mentioned. And also, I think we need to go much further in terms of making sure that every country feels secure in its borders, making sure no country believes another country's conventional forces are postured where there could be a quick surprise attack with conventional forces. And that would lead right up the ladder to changing fundamentally the tactical nuclear postures of both NATO and Russia, having more transparency and accountability there, making sure that uh, we begin to understand that these tactical nuclear weapons are very unlikely to ever be used against uh, uh, each other. Uh, but are much more vulnerable to being exploited by terrorists or some type of accident or miscalculation. So, frankly speaking, we've arrived at the point where the thousands of tactical nuclear weapons that are in inventories uh, and some deployed are basically much more dangerous to us, to us than they are protection for us. Uh, all of those things need to be worked out. I would also think we need to start with U.S. and Russia and NATO uh, working together on joint threat assessments, including missile threats, and including uh, cyber threats, and including the drug problems. So those are all things that I believe we need to work on, and every step we take uh, on any of these matters will help build confidence, which is absolutely essential to address the others. So that would be my general thought, but I agree with what our RAND guest uh, just mentioned in terms of uh, the three challenges. In Moscow, Sam Green, do you have a question or a thought? Questions here. I have a question. Please, uh, Will England from the Washington Post. Uh, a, a political obstacle that will arise quite quickly will be the um, question of ratification of the New START Treaty in the U.S. Senate. Wouldn't a failure to ratify that treaty be a, a major blow to the trust that all of you have talked about, and, and in fact, to your entire initiative? Uh, Igor, would you be willing to address that question? <laughs> well, uh, I think that the question is about, uh, more about Washington than about in Moscow, if it will be ratified. Because I think that we agree to, to ratify together, uh, simultaneously. Uh, and uh, as I understand the question, the question is after elections, if uh, there may be some problems in, in the Congress. Uh, um, I, I think personally that uh, that treaty was uh, signed and is good not for one party or some group of, uh, of uh, political interest. This is for U.S. and for Russia, for both countries. And uh, from my point of view, and after our uh, talks in, in Washington, I, I understood that uh, both parties, they agreed that it was necessary to ratify and this is what we expect in Moscow, that that treaty has to be ratified. And not only ratified, but we have immediately to go ahead with further negotiations uh, about nuclear reduction and also in other fields uh, of uh, disarmament. 
Igor Wolfgang stressed in his comment the importance of progress in the U.S.-Russia relationship in general for developments in the Euro-Atlantic. And when I listen to commentators responding to the question that's been posed in Moscow, the answer that I get in ju judging the scene in, in Moscow is that if this is seen as essentially a problem that the administration has with the Republican opposition and that it doesn't provide insight or any negative view of what the intention of the administration is. That is, if the administration does continue to push to develop the relationship in a comprehensive sense, including the economic domain, and seems good faith committed, that while this will be a blow, it will not be a fatal blow. Is that your view? Igor? Well, uh, this is what, uh, this is what I, I think. We have... Uh, I had um, uh, some meetings, uh, also including on the level of our presidents. We have uh, different projects, and I think that it was before. When I was minister, we were uh, saying, and I think that it's true, that we have to construct our relations, not on the basis of one party. We have to construct on the basis of national interests, our relations. And we cannot adapt our relations political changes in both countries and I, I think that my idea after speaking with the Republicans and Democrats in, in the United States that this is uh, the, the main idea also in Washington. In Moscow we have uh, the same thing that uh, we need that relations. We speak our both countries and international uh, community. We need to construct on the solid basis thinking about the problems of, uh, of the future. We have a lot of common interests and we have a lot of common uh, challenges and threats. That's why we have to cooperate. And I think that this is what we are saying in our statement, speaking about Euro Atlantic uh, um, security uh, uh, space, uh, that we, we, have to, we have to understand that we are living in the 21st century with uh, new, and we need new ideas and the new idea is that this is uh, our our common uh, goal to work together uh, in the in the interests of our common security thank you igor let me turn then to brussels uh, and matthew royansky uh, a question or a comment there Thank you very much and good afternoon to, to all of you. Um, I, I think this is very interesting, particularly uh, what we heard about the, the paradigm shift in security uh, and also the mentioning of all the new challenges like cyber or terrorism or the critical infrastructure protection and the network security or international organized crime. What I feel a little bit about uh, a sense of not being comprehensive enough is that uh, as I heard the three introductions, Europe was often mentioned the European Union has not been mentioned at all. I took a brief look at the papers that we have here in the Carnegie Center in, in Brussels. The European Union is not being mentioned there. And I would just propose uh, to be a little bit more comprehensive uh, uh, in, in the overall approach of the, uh, of the concept and the project. Uh, there is going to be an EU-US summit as well in the coming days, in fact, at the end of next week. One of our major uh, issues on the agenda is going to be how we can promote security cooperation between the United States uh, and the European Union. And on issues like anti-terrorism or um, network security, uh, it meant in the very wide sense of the word of perhaps uh, critical infrastructure protection, including the cyberspace uh, protection. I think there are a number of issues that can be only addressed with the European Union as such being involved. There is added value created by the European Union. So uh, I just wanted to use this opportunity to, uh, to inject the idea of taking the EU into account as well. A very good point. And Ambassador Isinger, Wolfgang, would you comment? Yes, with, with, with great pleasure. Uh, I would certainly agree with everything that was just said about the importance and the relevance uh, of uh, the role of the European Union. Um, I think the reason why in this particular paper we focused on the NATO summit 
and on the OSCE summit is because these two summits are the ones that might be uh, problematic but might also produce, uh, you know, uh, enormous new steps forward. The US-EU summit, in my estimation, is not the problem. But the problem would be if the NATO-Russia uh, event turned out to be, you know, not useful, for example. Or if, uh, for whatever reason, the uh, Astana summit did not uh, produce a meaningful and forward-leaning uh, document that would uh, open the door to a, an enhanced role uh, of the OSCE. But I, have abso I absolutely share uh, your point about the role of the EU. While I have the floor, may I just, uh, from my European point of view and representing the European side of the uh, Commission, may I just uh, add a word about START. Um, it is obviously, first and foremost, a U.S.-Russian uh, treaty. But the implications of it are, of course, global and very far-reaching and, uh, in particular, of great importance for us in Europe. One reason, among many, is that without uh, a ratified uh, START treaty, there would be probably very little hope that we could address the issues which Senator Nunn just mentioned, uh, substrategic or tactical uh, nuclear weapons in Europe, and, of course, also conventional arms in uh, arms control in Europe, which remains, which remain both important agendas on the table and uh, which are of uh, substantial concern to European uh, nations. And with respect to uh, the uh, comment made by the colleague from the RAND Corporation, uh, when he mentioned frozen conflicts, I am happy to report uh, to you, and uh, uh, I think uh, some of the, those present were in the room when this happened. Uh, I have personally heard President Medvedev speak about his determination and his willingness, the, uh, the interest of the Russian Federation, to uh, work with us, with you know, Europeans, and of course with the United States, um, and with the neighbors in the region, to try to address uh, conflicts and frozen conflicts such, for example, as the one uh, confronting us now for many, many years in Transnistria. Uh, so I think there is, this is good news. There is a political willingness to, uh, to talk about these uh, frozen conflicts and to start working on them in a joint effort. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. We've promised to keep this session fairly tight, but I think we're at a stage where we might have one last round, uh, and we'll come back to Washington. Uh, Jim? Um, yes, one, one observation uh, first, uh, and that is that this commission has tried to look at security in its broadest dimension. You've had allusion to some of the issues that go beyond conventional hard security such as uh, difficulties with narcotics, organized crime, and so on. But there is an economic dimension to it as well that people have been concerned about. So energy security, uh, issues of how we will promote economic well-being uh, that at least is roughly uh, uh, evenly spread so that we don't have real, really poor countries and so on. I'd like to know uh, from perhaps one of the questioners or commenters here in Washington whether there's uh, something to be said about the broader concept of security than just hard security. Uh, Ed Verona from the U.S.-Russia Business Council. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, take part today. Um, one area where there has been considerable progress in the bilateral relationship uh, is um, in the economic and commercial field. Uh, and there are indications that Russia may be able to achieve its long-held uh, goal of getting into the WTO sometime in 2011. Great progress has been made uh, since President Obama and President Medvedev met in June here in Washington. Um, we've almost, well, there are a couple of outstanding bilateral issues, but there's certainly hope that that'll be done by the end of this year. And then multilateral 
negotiations which continue on an informal basis uh, could be resolved sometime uh, in the first half of next year. But the one sticky, outstanding issue uh, is Georgia, which is the one country that uh, still has not given uh, its assent to, uh, to Russia's accession. Uh, uh, and uh, I think this, this is something that uh, uh, the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative may be able to address. Uh, and certainly Georgia's concerns uh, are, from their point of view, uh, territorial integrity and, and sovereignty. Uh, but maybe at the core of that is another concern about their security. And if that could be addressed somehow uh, in the context of this uh, uh, WTO negotiating process, um, that would be the key to getting Georgia to remove its uh, um, restriction or its objection to Russia's accession to the WTO. And I wonder if any of the uh, participants here would have a view of how that might be achieved. Thank you, Ed. Uh, the Commission is certainly very much aware of the importance of the Georgia question for not merely the bilateral Russian-Georgian relationship, but for all of the larger relationships, the U.S.-Russia relationship, for this project itself, the Euro-Atlantic Security Initiative. Uh, it, is, it is a critical element, the question of Georgian security, and within that, the unresolved issues of the separatist territories in what Ambassador Easinger referred to, I earlier, as the gray zone in security. It needs to be addressed. Whether it can be successfully addressed and resolved within the time period that you would want to see the WTO issue advanced is a separate question. And I think uh, in both U.S. diplomacy with Russia on WTO, where the target is completing this, as you know, by summer of this year, and the European partners working on this issue, there will need to be progress made on that front, probably in a separate fashion. But the Georgia question is absolutely central to what we're doing, and I think the Commission will come forward with constructive ideas in this area. In, in Moscow, uh, uh, Igor, did you, would you comment on this, or in Brussels, Alexandra, because you're a neighbor, you're very much involved with this question. Uh, do you have some thoughts on the Georgia problem? In, to my mind, I totally agree that now in the Euro-Atlantic region exists gray zone. Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, Azerbaijan, the country with unsettled security umbrella. And the key task of our commission to propose future formula of security umbrella, stable security umbrella to these other countries. First of all, for Ukraine, because this is a leader. And to my mind, without decision of this question, it will be impossible to speak about creation of new, qualitatively new, Euro-Atlantic security space. I think we have to follow this and decide this question from this point of view. Of course, Georgia question is very sensitive. But we also need some kind of peaceful reconciliation, strategic reconciliation on line Washington, Brussels, Moscow, on Georgia question, with very deep involving Georgia authorities in this dialogue. And the last message from Belisi, that they will be flexible on WTO Russia accession process, very good signal to, to us. And we discussed this question during our meetings. It's good. Well, if, if I could give Ambassador Pierre Morel, who is the EU Special Representative for Georgia, a chance to comment. He's been waiting. Good. Very good. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, exactly the follow-up. <clears throat> Indeed, we ha must have the wider perspective, and this would be welcome from the Commission. But since we are concentrated on the summits, uh, by the way, I mean, good also to have an EU-US uh, summit, because there has been some uh, missing summits in the past. So at least having one and more good is, I think, uh, also uh, useful in that context. Uh, but. Uh, we have to look in, uh, to, to Lisbon and Astana also in this context. We know that there is a certain fatalism. Don't hide that. I mean, we cannot hide that. Uh, that is, nobody thinks that such summits will solve the problem. But I think we have seen to quote a well-known book uh, how in the last years we don't need any more little worlds, little walls which shook the world. 
and we know how slippery this protracted conflict can be. And therefore, I will see as important in the Lisbon and Astana summit signals, signals of readiness, signals for further work. I, I can measure that on a, on a week, uh, monthly basis uh, with the Geneva talks. But we know we don't have the solution at hand. But we need to move forward and summits which will not be the occasion for exchange of signals, at least, and moves of protracted conflict, will be then read as uh, adverse signals de facto. So I think we have a real stake there, and this is a time for mobilization in the, in the weeks to come. Where can we go a good direction? The other, other element I would like to mention, and precisely because we have an OEC summit, it has been already quoted, this is a drug trafficking. This is a major security threat, we know, affecting a large array of population. Uh, we can see a raising awareness in Russia. I think we must seize this opportunity, and we know nobody has the answer except that having the international organization working together, I mean, NATO, E2, uh, OSCE, uh, as well as United Nations uh, in, uh, in uh, Vienna, UNODC, I mean, we know we can work much better together. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, those around the table know well, Pierre Morel and his role, but for the Internet viewers, let me underscore <laughs> the importance of his comments. He is the chief EU representative in the OSCE UN uh, and EU uh, Georgian talks in Geneva. They've just finished the 13th round of those week before last. So he is as close as anyone on this question. Let's finish with a last question or comment from Moscow. Sam Green, do you have someone there? Well, we certainly have uh, Minister Ivanov who wanted to comment on that, on that topic, and then I'll give it to a question. Uh, <clears throat> two words. Uh, answering uh, to the previous question, I think that what in our statement, we speak about trust and uh, confidence measures. Uh, we understand that there are a lot of problems, difficult problems, which we cannot resolve uh, immediately. And Georgia is one of them. And, uh, for example, if we take the Karabakh example, we see that we are working together, Europeans, Russians, and Americans, and uh, it's, it's a very long uh, way to reach a real agreement. That's why Georgia is delicate. I will not speak too much about this problem because you, you know everything. But I think that it's not good to, to mix Georgian problem and, for example, the, the, the WTO. What we have to do, to, to, not to create more problems, but to resolve what we can resolve and to create with that steps more trust and more um, uh, doing for, 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 for better conditions for the political uh, negotiations. I repeat, it's, it's not easy, but if we don't have trust and the confidence, we cannot uh, go ahead. And I agree with Ambassador Moran that it's need to give signals in, in the ne during the next summit positive signals to, 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 to the direction for the solution and not to create more problems. We have enough problems. We have to resolve them and not to create. Thank and lastly, we had a question from uh, Artyom Zavardov at Rasiske Gazeta. Uh, this question partially overlaps with some of, the, uh, some of what has been said, and it's directed more toward the European and American participants. But um, I guess in hearing what's been said today, I'm looking for what underlying factors uh, are there that would unite this particular uh, partnership? Are there common values that would bring together um, Russia, Europe, uh, the United States, and Canada into a common security structure? Uh, are there economic factors beyond just Russia's desire to join the WTO? Um, to put it bluntly, how is this partnership more realistic, uh, more interesting toward Russia than other similar structures that it participates in, such as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn to both Sam and Wolfgang on this, and we'll, we'll finish uh, with their concluding thoughts as well. Sam? Well, let, let me just say one, one on the previous question on the start uh, treaty ratification. I am still 
cautiously optimistic that it can and should and will be ratified during the lame duck session. If you wait until the next year for the new Congress, then there'll have to be a re-education process because there's so many new senators, and that will delay it for a considerable period of time. So I think it's imperative that it be addressed and hopefully ratified during the uh, lame duck session. The administration has had several Republicans uh, on board, led by Senator Luther, also Senator Isaacson from my state of Georgia. Uh, I am encouraged in that respect. I also believe that there has been a prima facie case made by the administration, including a number of military and defense experts, including virtually all those who have commanded our nuclear forces in the past who have testified for this, uh, this treaty. Uh, so I think at some point, uh, maybe in the near term, the burden is going to shift to those who are opposed to say what they are planning to do about such important issues as verification uh, if we do not have a treaty at all. So mark me down as cautiously optimistic on that subject. Thank you. Wolfgang? Well, in response to the uh, question uh, asked, uh, let me say I don't think the question is uh, what is more important for Russia, the Shanghai arrangement or uh, the relationship with the European Union and NATO and the United States. Obviously, uh, both are important, but this is, uh, an, uh, these are issues where we have found as um, independent members of this commission from all three areas, Russia, the United States, and Europe, that we strongly believe that we have, uh, that we share a problem, and that we also uh, face together um, enormous new opportunities in the area of creating more trust militarily, in terms of trying to demilitarize our general relationship, um, in terms of um, exploring uh, better opportunities than in the past to um, make the best use of the interdependence created in energy and in, in, a, in a number of other economic and, and business areas. Uh, the question is, uh, what, is, is this now a win-win situation between Russia and other countries in Eastern Europe and beyond, uh, Western Europe and the United States? We strongly believe it is. But this must be translated now, and that's what we stand for, into a uh, more mature public consciousness in all three areas, because we understand that there are many in Russia, in the United States, and in Europe who have not yet fully understood that the risks that we're looking at are in the future going to be more and more shared and common risks, um, and the interests that bind us together are going to be more and more common interests. Thank you. Thank you, Wolfgang. Uh, Igor, one last thought. I agree with uh, Sam and Walden. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I want to thank on behalf of the co-chairs and my colleagues at Carnegie, all of you in Washington and Brussels and in Moscow who have attended today. Uh, the Euro Atlantic Security Initiative is only one of many efforts that are underway now with various organizations. We look forward to cooperating with other institutions and other organizations that are addressing this problem. We think it's a time uh, when an idea uh, it, it has come. Uh, and uh, in addressing this issue, as Ambassador Collins said, in a comprehensive sense, not merely the traditional political military issues, but economic, environmental, energy security, the new threats from cyber, nuclear proliferation, and the human dimension of security, as it's put in the OSCE documents. Uh, we think, in addition, a commission that is composed of people as prominent as the members of, of the Euro-Atlantic uh, Security Initiative from all three areas working this problem in order to create the common spirit that Minister Ivanov has so stressed is an important part of this process. So thank you for being with us this morning and this afternoon, and the best of luck to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.